Hello, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. This will be part three and probably the conclusion of the Bible study, Eagle's Wings. So let's take a look and see what we got. In Isaiah chapter 40, we read the following. Verse 29, he, which being God, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now, I was going to do make this another big Bible study, but I don't think so. I was wanting to do something a little bit uplifting. I'm tired of doing exposés and exposing all the works of the devil. So I thought, well, you know. Now, Eagle's Wings ties in Exodus with the book of Revelation, believe it or not. And I'll get to that. But if you want to read some really interesting stuff, you can read in Ezekiel, E-Z-E-K-I-E-L, the book of Ezekiel, probably one of the most neglected books in the Bible. It's pretty wild. Uh, it's not an easy book, in my opinion. But it talks about <laughs> an angelic being. Well, the Bible, King James calls them living creatures. And... This is going more into angiology than anything else, more so than my Bible study. But if you want to uh, read it, you could uh, on your own. Well, let's read this real quick. Uh, let's see. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Chebar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. So Ezekiel was with the captives. So this was either the Assyrian captivity or the Babylonian captivity. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure which one it is. Ah, it tells you in the fifth day of the month, which was the 50th year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. So that tells you right there, if you're interested in doing that. I believe it's the Babylonian captivity. So, The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel, the priest. So Ezekiel was a Levite, evidently. The son of Buzi in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chebar. Ah, the Chaldeans. So that was the uh, Babylonians. Yes, this is definitely the Babylonian captivity. By the river Chebar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. So I have not read the book of Ezekiel in quite a while. I'm definitely not an expert on the book of Ezekiel. I think Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah are three of the hardest books in the Bible. Verse 4, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. Hmm. A great cloud and a fire. Isn't that what the Lord used to lead Israel out of Egypt? A cloud by day and a fire by night? Oh, yeah. We read about that in parts 1 or parts 2. I forget which one of this particular Bible study. 
A whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. So they call these living creatures. I'm going to assume they're some type of angel. So they had four faces and four wings. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled with the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they, had, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. So they've got face of a man, face of a lion, face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. Now, if you will do, I'm not going to go into it, but um, Israel was divided up into four camps. You had the three northern camps, three southern camps, three camps on the east, three camps on the west, and I believe their standard was the man, the lion, the ox, and the eagle. I mean, after all, the lion was to be the symbol of the tribe of Judah, right? Isn't Christ called the lion of the tribe of Judah? And I forget the ox, and I forget the man, and I forget the eagle. you got to realize, the Bible is three quarters of a million words. That's 750,000 words. And I've read it from cover to cover. I know a little bit about a lot of things. But when it gets to something specialized, you know, I'm definitely not a know-it-all. I try to be a general generalist. I mean, some people just specialize in prophecy. I met one guy. All he ever, um, mostly his studies was Genesis. This guy knew Genesis inside and out. Um, I could converse with him and ask questions, but, you know, this guy had spent like 30 years on just Genesis. He knew it. I mean, and uh, but I don't do that because I try to know the whole book. So, all right, so they got four faces. Verse 11. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went, every one, straight forward, whither the Spirit was to go. They went, and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creature, their appearance was like the burning coals of fire, and their appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. Boy, wouldn't that be scary, huh? And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Hmm. Um, <laughs> can you imagine that? Lightning flashes, they're there. Lightning flashes, they're gone. Lightning flashes, they're there. Boy, I'll tell you what. Verse 15. Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth of the living creatures with his four faces. All right, so if you want to continue reading about this, you can um, study it on his own, on your own. And uh, there's more. Let's see. Let me take a look at this. Verse 16. 
I guess we're going to make this a long Bible study. I was going to try to do this uh, short one, but this is kind of interesting. All right, so what are these living creature things, right? So the answer to that is found in Ezekiel chapter 10. So let's take a look. Verse 1. Then I looked and behold in the firmament, that's the sky, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. So evidently, this is God's throne. And he spake unto the man clothed with linen and said, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, and fill thine hand with coals of fire from beneath the cherubims, and scatter them over the city. And he went in my sight. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub. Now people, there's a big heresy going on today uh, among the Hebrew roots people and the so-called Messianic Jews. They want you to think the glory of the Lord is the she Kina. S-H-E-K-I-N-A-H. There's a word that's spelled and pronounced similar to Shekinah, but it's not the same word. Okay? The Shekinah is from the Kabbalah, and it's the Queen of Heaven. Yeah, it's what the Catholics turn Mary into. And if you want to read about the Queen of Heaven, you could read about her in the book of Jeremiah. The, the children of Judah were worshiping the Queen of Heaven. you got to ask yourself, is, does God the Father have a wife, the goddess? And do they have relations and have a son born by the name of Jesus? Well, that's, uh, well, they believe, uh, some of us wants us to believe that that's what happened. That matter of fact, that falls right into Mormon doctrine. But, um, you know, they want us to believe that that's the deal. But the Shekinah is the goddess. Believe it or not. And they want us to think that the Holy Spirit is the Shekinah, the glory of the Lord. Don't believe it, people. It comes from the Kabbalah, not from the Bible. You, can't, you cannot find that doctrine in the Bible. Period. So please do not, do not fall for that, please. So, all right. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the cloud was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And the sound of the cherubim's wing went even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. And it came to pass when that when he had commanded the man clothed with linen, saying, Take fire from between the wheels, from between the cherubims, that he went in and stood beside the wheels. And one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims, unto the fire that was between the cherubims, and took thereof, and put it into the hands of him that was clothed with linen, who took it and went out. And there appeared in the cherubims, the form of a man's hand under their wings. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubims, one wheel by one cherub and another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was as the color of a barrel stone, which is mentioned in the um, New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation, people. A barrel Verse 10, as for their appearances, they four had one likeness, as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. 
You know, there's been a lot of science fiction movies where they have a wheel and a wheel and they spin around and it causes whatever, time travel or traveling to different dimensions or whatever. I wonder if they're trying to pollute the meaning of whatever it is that this is trying to teach us. And I'll be honest, I don't know what the wheel, the, the meaning of a wheel within the wheel. I have no idea. But I just know that if, if Hollywood is teaching it, it's most certainly a lie. Verse 11. When they went, they went upon their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the place whither the head looked, they followed it, and they turned not as they went. And their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they four had. As for the wheels, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel. And every one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. In verse 1, didn't it say face of a man? Well, this says the first face was the face of a cherub. The second face uh, was the face of a man. The third, the face of a lion. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. Well, the other creature had the uh, an ox, remember? This one has cherub. I don't know the significance. I'm just pointing it out. And the cherubims were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river of Chebar. And when the cherubims went, the wheels went by them. And when the cherubims lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. When they stood... These still, and when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also, for the spirit of the living creature was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. The cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. And, they, and uh, when they went out, the wheels also were Beside them, every one stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Chebar, and I knew that they were the cherubims. Every one had four faces apiece, and every one four wings, and the likeness of the hands of a man was under their wings and the likeness of their faces was the same faces which I saw by the river of Chebar, their appearance and themselves. They went, everyone, straight forward. All right, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 17, and then we're going to go to Revelation and go back to Exodus. Because Revelation grabs all of its symbolism from the rest of the Bible. Mostly, it seems like specifically the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, put forth a riddle, and speak a parable unto the house of Israel. Didn't Jesus speak a lot of parables? He would use something he would use something with an earthly meaning and apply it to a heavenly principle son of man put forth a riddle and speak a parable unto the house of Israel and say thus saith the Lord God a great eagle with great wings long winged full of feathers, which had divers colors, came unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. And he cropped off the top of his young twigs and carried it into a land of traffic. He set it in a city of merchants. Now, if you're interested, I've done a study on trees. 
And sometimes when the Bible's talking about trees, it's talking about trees that produce fruit that you can eat to nourish yourself. Other times, the Bible, when it talks about trees, is talking about family trees, human beings. That's, you know, I did a, in a, in a study on that. You can go to the search bar on my YouTube channel, type in trees, and take your pick. I believe there's a whole study. I'm, I have almost 800 different Bible studies on YouTube now. It's getting to the point I can't remember where they all are. So, some of the early ones were slideshows with just Bible verses, but the later ones for the last uh, several years are audio. So, I decided to break down and buy a microphone and learn how to Use it and convert audio to video format for YouTube. You know, I'm not a young guy that uh, kept up with technology. But believe it or not, I was on the inter internet back in the 80s. Oh yeah, believe it or not, I was. On my Commodore VIC-20 and CompuServe. And, but it's not what it is today. So, Alright, so... He cropped off the top of his young twigs and carried it to a land of traffic. He set it in a city of merchants. He uh, took also of the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters and set it as a willow tree. And it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature, whose branches turned toward him and the root thereof were under him. So it became a vine and brought forth branches and shot forth sprigs. There was also another great eagle with great wings and many feathers. And behold, this vine did bend her roots toward him and shot forth her branches toward him that he might water it by the furrows of her plantation. It was watered in a good soil by great waters that it might bring forth branches and that it might bear forth fruit. Didn't Jesus say that by their fruits ye shall know them? And that it might bear fruit, that it might be a goodly vine. Now, you could read in other places. Now, let me take a look. Now, the Bible will explain and interpret the Bible if you let it. If you use a King James... If you use the modern versions of the Bible, they'll change all the words so that you don't catch the connection. Jeremiah 6 and verse 9. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine. Turn back thine hand as a grape gatherer, into the baskets. Let's take a look at Hosea chapter 10 and verse 1. Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself according to the multitude of his fruit. He hath increased the altars according to the goodness of his land. They have made goodly images. Nahum 2.2 2. For the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob. Jacob is Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. For the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. So... Back to Ezekiel chapter, uh, verse 8. It was planted in a good soil by great waters that it might bring forth branches and that it might bear fruit, that it might be a goodly vine. Say thou, thus saith the Lord God, shall it prosper? Shall he not pull up the roots thereof and cut off the fruit thereof, that it wither? It shall wither in all the leaves of her spring, even without great power or many people to pluck it up by the roots thereof. Yea, behold, being planted, shall it prosper? Shall it not utterly wither when the east wind toucheth it? 
it shall wither in the furrows where it grew. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Say now to the, to the rebellious house, Know ye not what these things mean? Tell them, Behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem, and hath taken the king thereof, and the princes thereof, and led them with him to Babylon. See, Babylon, God used wicked Babylon to punish rebellious Judah. You see, the Assyrians took northern Israel captive. And they took, Assyria also took part of Judah, but not all of it. They couldn't take Jerusalem. But then after a while, Jerusalem got just as bad, and God sent the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. You can read about him in the book of Daniel. And they took Jerusalem captive. They took him. Well, you know, nothing changes. You think the United States is any different from Judah of old? No. Think Europe is any different than than Israel of old? No. Verse 13. So, all right. Uh, verse 12. Behold, the king of Babylon has come to Jerusalem and hath taken the king thereof and the princes thereof and led them with him to Babylon and hath taken of the king's seed, that's children, and made a covenant with him and hath taken an oath of him. He hath also taken the mighty of the land that the kingdom might be base. In other words, it's not going to be any good. That the kingdom might be base, that it might not lift itself up, but that by keeping of his covenant, it might stand. See, God gave Israel and Judah a covenant, but God didn't break the covenant. Israel and Judah broke the covenant. Verse 15. But he rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors into Egypt that they might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? Shall he escape that doeth such things? Or shall he break the covenant and be delivered? You see, Judah didn't trust the Lord to protect them. They didn't keep the covenant. No, 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 no. They, they went and asked Egypt where they came out of they made they tried to make a a, a covenant with Egypt and God didn't want that he wanted them to keep his covenant he would have protected them they're like no 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 we don't want God's protection we want the armies of Egypt to protect us against the king of Babylon or the Babylonians so But he rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors into Egypt, that they might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? The answer is no. Shall he escape that doeth such things? No. Or shall he break the covenant and be delivered? No. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwelleth that made him king, whose oath he despised, and whose covenant he brake, even with him in the midst of Babylon, shall he die. The king of Judah is going to die in Babylon. Neither shall Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company make for him in the war by casting up mounts and building forts to cut off many persons. Seeing he despised the oath by breaking the covenant, who broke the covenant? Judah did. Seeing he despised the oath by breaking the covenant, when, lo, he had given his hand and hath done all these things, he shall not escape. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, as I live, surely mine oath that he hath despised and my covenant that he hath broken, even it will I recompense upon his own head. And I will spread my net upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare. A snare is a trap, people. 
and he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, and will plead with him there for his trespass, that he hath trespassed against me. You know what trespassing is? It's being in a place where you're not supposed to be. Well, that's what Judah did against God. Verse 21. And all his fugitives with all his bands shall fall by the sword, and they that remain shall be scattered toward all winds. And ye shall know that I, the Lord, hath spoken it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also take of the highest branch of the high cedar and will set it. I will crop off from the top of his young twigs, a tender one, and will plant it upon a high mountain, an eminent, eminent. In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it, and it shall bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a goodly cedar, and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing, and the shadow of the branches thereof they sh shall they dwell. And all the trees of the field, all the trees of the field shall know that I the Lord have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and have made the dry tree to flourish. I the Lord have spoken and have done it. Hmm. All right, remember what we had just read? You know, it was a parable. Well, like I said, the Bible interprets the Bible. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 31, verse 1. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, of, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Remember, Judah sent to Egypt... You know, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude. Who art thou like in thy greatness? Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. Assyrian was a, a mighty empire. Okay? Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches, and with a shout, shout, shadowing shroud, and of an high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high, with her rivers running round about his plants, and set out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore his height was, as, as was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his boughs were multiplied, and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. All the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under his shadow dwelt all great nations. Thus was he fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. Listen to this carefully. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. What garden of God? Is this the garden of Eden? The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. What? I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him? Remember, the Assyrian, which, was, which were people, was called a cedar. 
And, and so if these are trees and they're in the garden of God, how could they have envy? Envy is an emotion. See, this is speaking in parables. Hmm. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Were there other family trees in, in, in the garden of Eden? You know, I, you know, I read this and it's like, you know, I don't know, unless Adam and Eve had a whole bunch of children real quick or, well, you know, over hundreds of years. I don't know. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height and hast shut up his top among the thick boughs and his heart is lifted up in his height, I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. And strangers, the terrible of nations, have cut him off and have left him upon the mountains and in all the valleys. His branches are falling and his boughs are broken by all the rivers of the land. And all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him. Upon his ruin shall all the fowls of the heaven remain and all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches. To the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height neither shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their, their trees stand up in their height. All that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death to the nether parts of the earth. For they are all delivered unto death to the nether parts of the earth. That, that when you talk about the netherland, I'm, I'm not talking about Holland, I'm talking about nether, that means below. For they are all delivered unto death to the nether parts of the earth in the midst of the children of men with them that go down to the pit. Ooh. Thus saith the Lord God, In the day when he went down to the grave, I caused a mourning. I covered the deep for him, and I restrained the floods thereof, and the great waters were stayed. And I caused Lebanon to mourn for him. And all the trees of the field fainted for him. Come on, trees don't faint. Obviously, these are figures of speech, parables, you know. I made the nations, verse 16, I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit. And all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. People, when you read Genesis 3, when, when the serpent uh, was conversing with Eve about, you know, the tree of good and evil, think about, think about the tree of good and evil. Matter of fact, read Genesis 3. What kind of a tree was in the midst of the garden? Was it an actual tree made of wood, or is it this kind of stuff? You know, I don't want to tell you what to think. What, that's what that's that's the that's the job of the Holy Spirit. But it, you know, it it, it makes you wonder. Was it, you know, talking snakes, fruit trees, uh, apple hanging from a tree that Eve ate? You know. I don't know. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fail, fall. I'm sorry, the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit. And all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. They also went down into hell with him unto them that be slain with the sword, and they that were his arm that dwell under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. To whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Now, there's your answer, right? Yet shalt thou be brought down with the trees of Eden unto the nether parts of the earth. 
Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh, and all his multitude, saith the Lord God. You know, the Lord doesn't say many good things about Egypt. In Revelation 11 and verse 8, speaking of the two witnesses that uh, confront the beast, the false prophet, in the final days, then the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit kills them. And we read the following. 11, Revelation 11 and verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Hmm. Spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Where was the Lord crucified? Rome? Uh, no. Istanbul? No. Mecca? No. New York City? Mm, no. No. Um, where, let's see, where was the Lord? Well, my Lord, who is Jesus, who is the Christ, he was crucified in Jerusalem. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. In the book of Hosea, in chapter 11 and verse 1, we read, When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and called my son out of Egypt. God called Israel out of Egypt. You better believe it. All right, let's go to the book of Matthew. We're getting ready to close out, but I'm trying to tie in a few things. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, and let me tell you something, people, the Bible from cover to cover is about Jesus, not Yeshua, Jesus. There's a reason why the Lord used Greek for the New Testament. I tell you what, if you got problems with devil's attacking you, you better use the name Jesus because there. I don't believe there's any power in the Yeshua. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Now, Herod's a king, and he doesn't want to get replaced by this Christ king. So, he's going to do what his father, the devil, wants him to do. Verse 4. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently, what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. Herod, what a snake he was. 
When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they part departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. Now the uh, Kabbalah Jews have a legend that uh, Jesus was able to perform his miracles because he learned magic in Egypt. No, I don't think so. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So Israel was called God's son, and so was Christ. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth. He was mad. Wrath is like wrath, anger. Was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently acquired of the wise men. That's a nice guy, huh? Go kill all the children? Boy, I tell you what, I sure wouldn't want to be Herod on Judgment Day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, Jeremiah, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping for the great morning, Rachel sweet, weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they were not. Yeah, they were not. They were not alive. They were killed. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judah in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. Hmm. So was Jesus a Bethlehemite? After all, he was born in Bethlehem, but yet he was called the Galilean. But he wasn't born in Galilee, he just lived there. And he came to dwell in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Hmm. So, is Jesus a Bethlehemite? A Galilean? A Nazarene? He's all those things. Please understand something. Just because, uh, you know, for example, Ruth might have lived in the land of Moab. She was called a Mo Moabite or a Moabitess. You know, um, one of the apostles was called a Canaanite. Well, was he a Canaanite by blood or just because he lived in the land of Canaan? 
you know, was was Jesus of Bethlehem? Was he from Galilee, Nazareth? You know, he was, uh, but yet he was of the tribe of Judah. So just because somebody calls you, you know, uh, right now, I've lived in Florida for the majority of my life. I'm called a Floridian, but I wasn't born here. So, all right, let's keep going. All right, I was going to try to make this a shorter Bible study, but I was wrong. All right, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 4. I'm just going to throw this out there. Verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. You know, these four and twenty elders, I, 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 I could be wrong, but I bet you, I bet you it's the twelve twat tribes of Israel. You know, Jacob, Levi, Dan, maybe, I don't know. I don't know if Dan's going to be in there or not, but, um, you know, the twelve sons of Jacob, Israel, Maybe Joseph, his two sons, I don't know. But I think it's going to be the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. I think that's who these 24 elders are. 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. One apostle for each of the 12 tribes. And I think Paul's going to be one of them. Replaced Judas. But that's just my opinion. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts, full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Isn't this just like the language we read in Ezekiel? Oh yeah. And the four beasts had each one of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is, and is to come. And is to come. Interesting. All right, so. The four beasts. And they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Why do they say holy three times? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, there's a big thing. Um, I don't like particularly like the word Trinity. But let's face it, people. God made man in his image. And the Bible clearly teaches that man has a body, man has a soul, and man has a spirit. They're all not the same. Your soul is not your spirit, and your soul is not your body. They're all separate. We are three parts 
that makes up one man. And if God made man in his image, why can't God be three parts? Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. You know, you've got oneness, so-called Pentecostals. You've got the Jews. You've got the Jehovah's Witnesses. They will totally, they totally deny that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are part of the Godhead. Oh, I don't like Trinity so much, but the word Godhead is in the Bible. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Oh yeah, one day Jesus is going to come. Ain't going to be the flood of Noah, people. It's going to be by fire. Remember Jesus said he's going to, uh, there's going to be a, or was it John the Baptist, said that there was going to be a baptism of fire? Oh yeah. And when those bees give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. For thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. Do you know that we were created for God's pleasure? Oh yeah. We were created for God's pleasure. You know, if you bring a dog home for the family and the dog wants to bite everybody and uh, pretend it's the alpha and bites your family and, and won't go outside to use the bathroom Guess what? Chances are you're going to get rid of that dog. Well, same thing, people. Why is God going to let a rebellious and stubborn people that won't listen to him, why is he going to let them exist? We were created for his pleasure. If you don't like it, well, you could do what Satan did. And, you know... Uh, that's not going to end well. All right, so. Remember in, in the first and second studies of this, we studied how God took Israel out of Egypt. Let's review this really fast. Exodus chapter 19. We're going to read verses 2, 3, 4, and 5. For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert, desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I, have did, what I did unto the Egyptians. Yeah, all the plagues. And then he drowned the army in the Red Sea, remember? Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Let's read that again. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings, I, God, bore you on eagles' wings out of Egypt. And how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if, if, when these liars tell you that the Jews have an unconditional covenant with God, uh, well... That's not true. 
That's not true. God's covenant was conditional. It was conditional upon Israel and Judah keeping their end of the bargain, which they did not do. Now, therefore, if, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, they didn't. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. All right, so here's the punchline. Turn to Revelation chapter 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. I guess I need to interpret. What is this? A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars? Hmm. Twelve stars. Where, what, what does the Bible talk about 12? Oh, wait, the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Yeah, but I wonder, does that have anything to do with this? A great wonder in heaven? A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars? Where does, eh, where, have we read anything about like this before? Hmm, good question, huh? Well, let's take a look. All right, remember when I told you the Bible interprets the Bible? Well, let's interpret the Bible with the Bible. Genesis chapter 37. Now, if you are even remotely interested in going to the Shack movie or the reading the book, The Shack, uh, you know, because... People like Kent Hoven, I loved the old Kent Hoven. The new Kent Hoven, I, I just, I can't, I can't do it anymore. I mean, I used to listen to many, many hours of his studies. I don't know what happened to him in prison, but he's not the same. But uh, he recommends the shack. Well, if you want to read a story about forgiveness, read the story of Joseph. That is far better, and you'll learn far more than you will from some heathen satanic shack. Jesus said, my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again to receive you unto myself. I think I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but you get the idea. I don't want to live in a shack. I want to live in a mount, a, a, a mansion. I'd rather, much rather live in a mansion, although God wants to give me a little shack. I'll take it. But you want to read about forgiveness? Read about the story of Joseph in Genesis. Matter of fact, Genesis 37 is as good a spot to, as any. Let's start in verse 1. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Now, if you lived in Canaan, wouldn't they call you a Canaanite? Uh, there were people who were descended from Canaan, who was Ham's son, who was cursed by Noah. They moved to the land of Canaan. That's why they called it the land of Canaan. They named it after their father, Canaan. Some people say he was related to Cain. I don't know if that's true. Bible doesn't, there's a lot of things the Bible doesn't tell you. Why would you, why would you name your son Canaan, you know, after the first, you know, murder, Cain? I, I don't know. Verse 2. These are the generations of Jacob. Now, Jacob's name was um, changed to Israel. 
These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. You know, every time I think about the coat of many colors, I think about the uh, Scottish plaid. I, you know, I don't know if that's a connection there, but that's what I think of. Scotland and their plaid. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Ah, listen uh, carefully. And Joseph dreamed a dream. Joseph dreamed a dream. And he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And you know what? They sold Joseph into slavery where he went to Egypt. That's how Israel ended up going to Egypt. People don't read the Shaq, read Joseph's story. It's so much better than the Shaq. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and stood upright. Behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. Hmm. Now, when you when you cut wheat, you're cutting the sheaves. That's you know the stalks of wheat and what have you. You know when they bind them, they're you know gathering them up and then they take them to the miller and. The miller shakes him up, and he uh, gets the wheat kernels from off the stalks. So he had a dream. They were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheave arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. Now, I did an entire study on Joseph and forgiveness. It was many, many hours. You could take a look at my playlist, find it, listen to it if you're interested. But I tell you what, Joseph is, boy, I tell you what, that's, that's forgiveness. Forget the shack. Well, now, what does it mean to be obeisance? That means to bow down. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? In other words, are you going to be a ruler, our, our ruler? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? What is dominion? It's rulership, people. And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Ah, and he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, listen carefully. I have dreamed a dream more and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. The sun, the moon, the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Well, Joseph was obviously the twelfth star. But the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars, eleven of the twelve, bowed down to Joseph. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him. His father rebuked him. And said, what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Ah, listen carefully. He's going, jo Joseph is going to, inter uh, Jacob is going to interpret the dream 
for his son Joseph. What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I, the sun, and thy mother, the moon, and thy brethren, the eleven stars, indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? Ooh, that makes sense, doesn't it? What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy father and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Ooh. And his brother went and his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Well, if you don't know the rest of the story, they throw him into a pit. They were going to kill him. But instead, they sell him into slavery. And he goes to Egypt. And if you don't know these stories, people, you know, you're, you're doing yourself a big disservice. All right, let's go back to Revelation 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. Who's the woman? Israel. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Remember the eleven stars that were Joseph's brethren? And the twelve stars, Joseph. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. What's this, people? This is the war in heaven. And the dragon... And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Isn't that what happened in Bethlehem? Herod was Satan's man. Oh yeah. And she brought forth a man-child, Christ, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Remember, people? Isn't that what happened? When Christ was resurrected on the third day, he went up into heaven? Listen carefully. And the woman, which is Israel... You know, modern Bible preachers will try to tell you that the woman here is the Jews, but we're the bride of Christ. They'll try to make you think that, oh no, these are two, two different things. Two different things. The, the woman is one thing and the bride's another thing. No, people. It's one and the same. God is not going to be um, how would you say, he's not going to have multiple wives. There's one bride. That's the bride of Christ. God is not into polygamy. Verse, Revelation 12, verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, isn't that what happened in Egypt when God took them into the desert in the wilderness of sin? And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's three and a half days, uh, three and a half years, people. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, 
and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent. That old serpent. Why the old serpent? Because that serpent been around for a long time. Think about that next time you read Genesis 3 about the serpent talking to Eve. The tree of good and evil. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. See, the Bible interprets the, de the Bible. The great dragon, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto death. Boy, I tell you what, pre-trib rapture preachers do not want to ever touch this. Never. Well, they can't. And they overclaim him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Oh, isn't this just like, didn't we just read that? Didn't we just read that somewhere? Uh, let's see. Where did we read that? Hmm. I wonder. Exodus chapter 19, verse 2. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Eagles' wings, people. Eagles' wings. Let's go back to Revelation. Let's see, Revelation. Revelation 12. Verse 14, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, that's a year, and times, that's two years, and half a time, that's half a year. That's three and a half years. That's the same exact time period as when we read, uh, let's see, the uh, it says, And the woman, verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared to God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Three and a half years, people. A thousand two hundred and three score days. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished, for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. 
And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Do you know what, people? That's happening right now. The serpent opened his mouth in a flood. All right, so what's this about the flood of waters? Let's take a look at Isaiah 17 and verse 12. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. Hmm, okay. Well, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 17. Now, this is a very, very important thing. Oh, let's, where should I start? I guess we'd better start in verse 1. What do you think? Revelation 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials. Well, this is the tribulation period. God's pouring out his judgment upon the earth. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying, Come, um, come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. The great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Didn't we just read about that in the other? Yeah. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now, a lot of people will tell you, oh, this is the Catholic Church because they, they use these colors, purple, scarlet, gold, precious stones. Well, yeah, it could be, you know, but you know what? When you read the book of Leviticus, guess what the... Levitical priesthood had purple, scarlet, gold, precious stones. Same thing. They had the exact same colors. Read the book of Leviticus, how they the priesthood would, uh, you know, and, and just think, the, um, the Antichrist over in the Middle East, they want to rebuild their temple. Oh, yeah. And they're going to reinstitute the priesthood if they do it. Uh, personally, I'm of the opinion they're going to be able to do it, but we'll see what happens. Having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication, and upon her name was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the blood, drunk, uh, the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Huh. Whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world? Were our names written in the book of life before God even created the earth? Really? Yeah, if you tell people to read this, they'll say, Oh, you're a Calvinist! Oh, you're one of those evil, wicked Calvinists! 
do you know that maybe there's people whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world? I don't know. Whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Here is the mind that hath which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Do you know that there are a number of cities on seven hills? Moscow, communism. Of course, they tell you Rome. And there's a number of others. I believe uh, Istanbul, Turkey. But there's one other city that has seven hills. Jerusalem, believe it or not. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and one is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome him, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Listen carefully. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And he saith unto me, the waters, the waters, W-A-T-E-R-S, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Let's go back to Revelation. Where are we reading? 12. Let's go read Revelation 12.12. 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Now that's not just necessarily Mary. I mean, that could be Israel as a whole, right? And to the woman were given... Two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that, she, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Didn't the Bible just explain what the water was? Peoples, nations. Isn't that what's happening in Europe and the United States? Are we not being flooded with heathen aliens in Europe and America? And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. That's coming, people. That's going to be a big earthquake. Let me tell you something. Verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, 
which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I don't care if the Jews keep the commandments. They don't have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I don't care if you have the testimony of Jesus Christ. God expects you to keep the commandments. Well, what commandments? Uh, well, let's take a look. In John chapter 14 and verse 15, Jesus said, If, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Huh, okay. What commandments? I thought Christ was our, uh, you know, I thought Christ was, you know, the one that kept all the commandments for it, so we don't have to. Well, let's take a look. Go to Matthew 22, verse 35. Boy, I've beaten this horse many times. Matthew 22, 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Can you love the Lord? Can you love your neighbor? Boy, I tell you what, I have never seen such hatred from people that supposedly love Jesus. And there are certain Bible verses I will post online or say Jesus' own words and to hear the most vile things from their mouth calling me or uh, the words of Jesus as being anti-Semitic. Boy, I tell you what, do those people love the Lord? I, I, you know, that's not for me to say. But I tell you what, I would sure hate to be railing on people that are quoting Jesus' own words. Do they love the Lord? I don't know. I don't know. But you know what, people? There's going to come a time... When the church, the woman, is going to have to flee to the wilderness. And God's prepared a place. And just like he did in Egypt, so He will he do in the future. Now, I've mentioned this a few times in my Bible studies, but it, you know, it bears reading again. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, We read verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all, all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat the manna, right? And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. See, Moses, they went to the desert, and Moses struck the rock, and water came out. Now, you got to realize, Corinthians was a city in Greece the people in Corinth spoke Greek for the most part. Majority of them did. Unlike when you go to Miami, Florida, which is a city in the United States where most people don't speak English. Well, they can, but they won't. They speak Spanish. But uh, these are Greeks, people. And yet, and yet uh, Paul's saying that we were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea. 
and did and did all eat the same spiritual meat. See, Paul's telling the Corinthians that the church was baptized with Moses in the cloud and the sea. The Red Sea, they crossed with Israel. And they did all drink the same spiritual rock, for they drank of that spiritual rock to follow them, and that rock was Christ. See, right here, God is telling you, through Paul, that at least some of the Corinthians were Israelites. Now, you know, some of you that go to the church churches don't waste your time on the pastors. Most pastors, in my opinion, are sent of Satan to deceive the flock. You want to present some good information to them? Go to the Bible studies and, and show them stuff. Don't be argumentative. Just say, oh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to, to read something, you know, and then read it. And if it contradicts what they say, even better. And those sheep that hear the voice of God when you're reading them, eventually, um, well, eventually you'll be booted out of the church because your their job is to lead the flock astray. And they can't have somebody teaching them the truth when they're lying to them. So eventually you'll get booted out of the church. Chances are. But if you could bring one or two of the sheep with you and have home Bible studies, that's great. But don't waste your time with the pastors. Do not waste your time. So, that's my opinion. So, guess what, people? Paul told the Greeks in Corinth, Corinthians, that they were with Moses when they crossed the Red Sea. They did eat the spiritual meat, which was the manna, and they did drink the spiritual rock, the water, which was Christ. And that's what the Bible is, people. The Bible's a book to, for, and about Israel and their Messiah, the Christ, Jesus. From cover to cover, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22. Well, I hope you learned something. Um, I found some interesting things. I like doing word studies. I find every time I do a Bible study, I find something new. And I hope you do too. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God, who is Jesus the Christ. All glory to him in his precious name, who was slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.